Today's video is on interpreting the results of the blowing snow control cost-benefit tool from the perspective of the landowner. Sponsors and partners for the blowing snow control tool are the Minnesota Department of Transportation and the University of Minnesota. This video is one of two videos on interpreting the results of the blowing snow control cost-benefit tool. The other video is on interpreting the results from the perspective of the transportation agency. The purpose of this video is to interpret the results of the blowing snow control tool from the perspective of the landowner. The landowner's perspective on blowing snow control will be quite different from one solution to another. For example, standing corn rows require a one-year contract to leave corn standing in the fall. In contrast, structural and living snow fences may require 15-year or longer contracts and in some cases selling the land. The cost of the farmer of leaving standing corn rows includes yield loss of, of approximately 45%. Yield losses occur because the corn is left standing over the winter and during that time the corn grain can be lost to animal predation or damage from weather. Leaving standing corn rows is also inconvenient for farmers. When planting, farmers must orient the rows parallel to the road. In the fall, farmers must leave corn standing and harvest around it. In the following spring, farmers must take out their combine just to harvest the standing corn rows. While the cost for standing corn rows is fairly straightforward, the costs for snow fences, both structural and living, are somewhat more complex. Unlike standing corn rows, snow fences may require farmland to be taken out of production. This land must either be leased or sold, and a snow fence must be installed in the field. Farming around this snow fence can be inconvenient for the farmer, and because two field edges are created, one on each side of the fence, a snow fence can reduce yields near that fence. A living snow fence must also be properly established and maintained so that it grows into an effective snow fence. When using land for a snow fence, the landowner may have two options. Either lease the land to the transportation agency or sell it. When a landowner leases, they get an annual payment based on cash rental rates. The landowner retains the asset and must pay debt servicing and taxes. The landowner also retains the option to use the land after the contract. The landowner may need to agree to maintain the, the snow fence. Living snow fences may be eligible for annual payments from the Conservation Reserve Program. The second option is to sell the land. This is a one-time contract and payment. The landowner loses an asset in exchange for cash and loses the option to use the land in the future. Funds from the sale of land could be used to invest or to pay down debt. The best option for the landowner will depend on their situation, what they plan to do with the land in the future, and other opportunities that they may have. For structural and living snow fences, there is a cost of insulation. If a transportation and or a conservation agency covers 100% of the insulation cost, then the landowner's cost will be zero. If the land is used to grow crops, Farming around a snow fence can be inconvenient. A snow fence takes, takes a single field and splits it into two fields. Farming around the snow fence increases the time and money it takes to manage the fields. In the case of a living snow fence, the farmer will need to be careful when applying herbicides near this fence. Not only is this inconvenient, but it can also reduce yields near the fence. A living snow fence must be properly established and maintained so that it grows into an effective snow fence. This could involve mowing, spot spraying, weeding, replanting, and or watering. Now that you have an overview of the cost of snow control from the perspective of the landowner, I would like to switch over to a live demonstration of the blowing snow control tool. The purpose of this demonstration is to show the location of the inputs for the landowner's cost and to explain how to interpret the results. This cost-benefit analysis that I will be demonstrating is publicly available 
at snowcontroltools.umn.edu. The first set of relevant inputs for the costs are the land section. This includes the land rental rate when renting the land and the land value when purchasing land. In the case of the living snow fence, a landowner may be responsible for establishment and maintenance. In this section, the user enters in the cost schedule. As you can see, these costs change over time. For example, the living snow fence is watered in year one and year two, but not in any years after. Now let's move on over to the results. The costs and benefits are reported in net present value over the, over the practice life, which in this case is 15 years. The first chart shows the cost to the landowner of four different blowing snow control solutions. The last chart reports the cost to the landowner on a per acre basis to help in determining a per acre payment rate. The landowner break even is the estimated annual amount per acre that the landowner needs to receive to break even. For example, if we look at the payment over time for a living snow fence, this chart shows costs are highest in the first couple of years due to the cost of establishment. There are ongoing costs to maintaining the living snow fence and renting the land. The costs are increasing due to inflation. Another example is structural snow fences. These do not require any establishment or maintenance and so have lower break even costs than the living snow fence. So that ends our discussion of interpreting the results of the blowing snow control tool from the landowner's perspective. For more information, you can go to snowcontroltools.umn.edu. Details are available in the user's guide, which you can find at the website along with answers to some frequently asked questions.